Uh, but I think the reality is that at, at some level, anything could potentially become a slippery slope for us. So how do we stay uh, in a place, Ashley, where we're vigilant about protecting ourselves and setting up those helpful guardrails? Maybe not just one time, but how do we make that you know, an ongoing part of our recovery and, and plan for health? Yeah, I would say too, I know we've talked about like all these kind of sneaky, slippery slopes, but if, if somebody's listening, they're in early recovery, we were really, really intense. I mean, John almost did not marry me because I would go to the bars and dance with everybody. And so I had to decide that my relationship with John, Jesus, myself was more important than yeah. whatever, like felt need I was chasing. And so I, you know, I had to say, okay, I'm not going to go out dancing. It was something I really enjoyed doing, but I did not do it for the first 12 years of our marriage. And then when I finally did go out dancing a couple of years ago, it was like a piano bar with my Bible study group. So, you know, it's, <laughs> I had, I, and I, and they knew, you know, they knew, yeah. I think even when I started traveling with you guys, it was like, I had all these boundaries around bars and, um, because sometimes you're eating at a bar and grill or, yeah just, just really, really cautious about that. And so I, I say, if you're early in recovery, do, do it all, like do everything. Yeah. You know, we had the, we had, we were able at that time to not have internet. You know, it's harder and harder, um, with jobs now. Um, I was experiencing a lot of panic attacks as a newly betrayed spouse. And so I could not watch or listen to anything dark. Even the scene with Snow White where she's like running through the forest, that was a trigger for me. So mm. I, I literally just didn't even watch TV because I was so, anything would trigger a panic attack for me. Um, I, I cut off social media, all social media for three years. And I wasn't struggling with the sexual addiction or temptation at that time. Mine was being triggered as a betrayed spouse. Yeah. And so that comparison was that comparison was triggering my body dysmorphia, which then was triggering my eating disorder brain. And so it's, it was like, mm. I really had to evaluate everything I let into my life and say, when I engage with this activity, am I, do I feel better about myself? Do I feel worse about myself? Do I feel better about my marriage? Do I feel worse? Do I feel yeah. closer to God, further from God? Am I feeling shame? I, I really I mean, you have to, when you're going through something like this, you have to evaluate, over-evaluate everything. And, you know, we didn't go to the beach for a couple of years. And and so much of that stuff, I mean, I was yeah. watching like killer shows the other day. I don't know. Hopefully nobody hates me for that either. But like so much of that has come back and it's fine. And we still have to like, okay, is this, is this appropriate? Is this going too far? Is this too sexual? We still have those conversations, but in the beginning, just cut, just cut it all out and give yourself yeah. that, um, that peace of mind, like let your limbic system calm down and turn off all the decision fatigue, the white knuckling, and just let yourself fully engage in recovery. And then, um, I, I really think the only way that you can maintain having good guardrails, is to keep up on your tools and on your tools with other people who know you. So your spouse, yeah. they'll be honest with you. I'm yeah. sure, yep. um, your group have, have people that can speak into your life and, and they have permission to be blunt and mm -hmm. honest. Um, I think that's the best thing we can do. I see people go downhill when they don't let people close to them, um, be blunt with them. Yeah. And so have those people that can, can say, you know, is that really healthy for you? I had to say that to a friend of the other day, like you are listening to so many books and, 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 your um, views with your kids is getting really short. And mm. I just think there's a connection there. And so it, and, and she was like, Hmm, that's interesting. You know, so yeah. um, have people that, that can do that for you. Yeah. The, the only thing I would just add on is just asking. And I think not even add on, I would just say with people, friends, groups, uh, group members and spouse, like ask the question, like, where do you see me isolating with what, at what yeah. times, with what behaviors? Because that they're gonna know, like they're gonna be like, well, when you're on your phone, you know, mm -hmm. or when you're when fantasy football season comes around or something like that, they'll be able to give you some clarity, stuff maybe that you can't see. Yeah, I, I remember hearing Dr. Ted Roberts say, "New levels, new devils," and the idea that when things <laughs> change in our life, uh, so do some of the the triggering areas or the things that could become a slippery slope. And so, I would say that if if you're going through any kind of season of change, you're going from single to married, you're going from yeah. Um, uh, an apartment to a house, you're getting a new job, you're changing positions, you're yeah. um, going through crisis or have had a death in the family, like just all those new environments tend to 
cause things to kind of get dysregulated and new things may begin to crop up. And I, I think that's the value of staying in community and being in group and talking with our spouses is that what, what at one time was maybe not an issue at all could suddenly become um, really a part of that pattern again. And so I think it's what we've talked about, that willingness to pull out our three circles tool and where we have created guardrails to evaluate, are these working? Is there anything I need to add? Is there anything I need to change? Because life is dynamic. And so our guardrails need to be dynamic along with it. Yeah. And we just need to have that eye on what, what is becoming, you know, because that's, that's the other thing is when we remove maybe some things that we've used as a crutch or an escape or a go-to and it's been our slippery slope and we take them out, at first there might be kind of some peace and relief like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm not battling that. But over time, you're probably going to find that something new starts to gravitate in that, uh, well, I didn't used to have that issue, but I'm realizing that now when I'm frustrated or upset, that's the new thing I do. Yeah. And if we're not right. attentive to that, it can become a new slippery slope all over. So the only other thing I would say is on our spouse's behalf is if, if this is part of our story, if betrayal trauma has happened in the relationship, they are maybe even more fearful of the slippery slope than you are, of feeling like, well... I know you're just doing this, but this leads to that, to that, to that, to that. And some of their fear or worry around that may last much longer Mm -hmm. than your own sense of being triggered by it. And, you know, I have to be reminded by this because there are still, and I I don't quite have my finger on it with with my wife, but even after 14 years, there are certain types of scenes and movies or TV shows that trigger her kind of fear response of, is Nick seeing this? And we've had several conversations where it's like, I didn't turn my head away and I'll say, I wasn't Nothing about that felt triggering to me. Mm-hmm. I was not at all, you know, e- yeah. excited by that. But she was. She was, yeah. and so she needed to see me honor her because she still has some, for whatever mm-hmm. reason, about. Like I said, it's not all the time. There's certain things yeah. that it, it just creates that in her. And so I've had to be mindful to go. Oh my, my slippery slope areas didn't just hurt me. Mm. They hurt people around me, and yeah, the people good. around me may still be semi-conscious of what they were long after I'm currently feeling it. So yeah. all that to just say, if, if you've had a slippery slope in your life and your spouse still kind of picks up on it, you may choose to still abstain from something because it honors them. Because you want to say, hey, I want to I want to be a safe person for you. And if for whatever reason, this still causes you worry, fear, concern, doubt that I'm making good choices, then I'm going to keep away from it because I want to create that safety for you. And I just, I think that's part of rebuilding mm-hmm. trust in our relationship. So um, again, even if you don't see it, but your spouse does, yeah. like be willing to make change to help them see that you're choosing integrity consistently. Yeah, I think that's such a good point you brought up. You know, recently, um, John was in Florida for work and it's like they stay in a hotel and it's men and women traveling. And and I know I do the same thing too, but I haven't, he hasn't felt betrayal from me in the way that I felt it for him. So um so it ends up being like, if I text him and I know they're out to dinner somewhere and they're on Daytona beach and you know, like all the things, bikinis and stuff, then I'm like, okay, it's been 45 minutes. He didn't respond. You know, like, is he going to be out all night because old things are triggered? Because at some point there was a time where he may go out with friends and he may not respond to me. When we first got married, there'd be times where he'd be gone and wouldn't respond to me like 12 days. And sometimes that was because he was out in the forest and there was no service. Other times it's because we were newlyweds and he was used to going on these fire rolls and not having any communication. And so um, old things would get triggered. And then I was able to remind myself like, well, what would it look like if I was out? I just was in Texas with all of you guys, you know, and it's probably the same thing. And I was able to kind of like calm myself down. Um, But what you're saying even about uh, what Michelle, you know, as a betrayed spouse, I shared this in another episode. Like if you are using the three circles, and you, you never saw your husband's center circle. You never saw the relapses because they were hidden. But what you did see a lot of is that middle circle. You saw a lot of the late night TV. You saw a lot of the sexual shows or the game playing or whatever, it, or the drinking or going out, like yeah. whatever it was that led to relapse. And then your visual stopped because the rest was under the surface. Yep. And so for them, they have like a, a connection with the whole circle. And so when they stop those inner circle behaviors and they're not relapsing anymore, and then maybe they engage in a middle circle behavior, that's like a, that's like a tremor for us. Like, Oh my gosh, I've seen this before. And this Mm -hmm. is what it used to be like. And so, um, I think that tool actually can be really good. It helped John understand why I would get triggered. And 
you guys will be so proud of me. He has been playing video games a little bit and it has not been triggering <laughs> lately. Um, but, <laughs> but at one point it did help him to, for me to show him his three circles and say like, this is the only part I ever saw was mm. the video game playing, the coming home late from work, the, you know, whatever it was. I never saw anything else. And so yeah. when we were early in recovery, he was very intentional about hanging out in only the outer circle. Because it's like, okay, we are gung-ho. We're going to do everything. We're canceling everything. We're going to hang out in the outer circle. And then slowly over time, like he went back to the gym, which is good for him. But it, but yeah. I have to be really careful to, right. to know you're using those things in a good way, mm -hmm. not a bad way. And so then it, those things require extra communication to make sure that we're using them in a good way. Totally. Yeah, it's good. I, I am glad we're doing this together as like yeah. guys and girls guys and gals because i i am curious to see from a male perspective how involved you know like you guys yeah. say that spouse should be is in in creating it and using it um i think my gym example is probably the example i just gave about the tremors when when he hangs out in the middle circle um but also the gym in example and so for me if i see mostly that he's doing the healthy things. And, and, and for me, again, the three circles is just the easiest visual for yeah, me. For sure. If he's 90% hanging out in outer circles and then like goes out to a bar and grill in Florida with some friends at work, but I have seen him be relational. I've seen him do his work. Yeah. I've seen him reading, praying, communicating well, getting good sleep. Then that's less of a trigger for me. Yeah. But if he was hanging out, you know, most of the time in that middle circle, like just staying up late, watching a lot of TV, cussing, drinking, I mean, whatever else may be in there. And then he's like going out to, you know, wherever with coworkers, I might feel more triggered because I will know that he's mentally probably not in the best space yeah. to, to navigate those temptations. And then um, one good example with the gym is just, going to the gym for health, not for escape. And so in the past it would be, we would fight or he would get um, frustrated with the kids and he'd be, and he would just up and leave, like grab his things, go, I'm going to the gym. And that was such a trigger because girls wear hardly anything in the gym. And then, um, and then now it, I can see that it's for health. And so we, we did have to have a conversation about that. I think it was three years post recovery like starting a recovery where he went fully back to the gym and, and it was like, okay, you can't go when we're, when you're fighting, like when we were fighting, cause that's totally a trigger. It feels like an escape. And, um, and maybe more than once a day is a little excessive right now. Like we're not in a CrossFit competition. And so <laughs> it just makes me nervous that you're always wanting to go there. Um, and then, um, uh. And then if you say you're on your way to home from work, and I know you two will understand this because you both have wives at home with children. If you say you're on your way home after a really long day with the kids, and then you're like, actually, I'm going to stop at the gym first. So it'll be another hour. Like I will blow my lid faster than anything. Um, <laughs> if you do not come home when you say you're coming home. So right. um, those were our three kind of yeah. uh, parameters we put in place. I think um, the first thing that came to mind with this question is just depending on where you are in recovery. Um, but if you're on the front end, I think that um, you need to do things that make your betrayed partner feel safe. Um, and so that may mean, you know, a lot of the stuff we've talked about, identifying those things that, um, you know, for John, didn't go to the gym for a while. Like, take that off the table. And yeah, that's something that may be good self-care, but believe it or not, there's other things you can do for self-care that your spouse may feel more comfortable with or may be okay, you know, like I need to be able to see you. You can buy weights and like, I'm going to watch you work out. Like, <laughs> that feels like something Ashley would have done. But I think that something like that, totally. you know, where I think that they need to be absolutely involved because it's them that you betrayed. And it's, that's the person you need to develop trust with again. And so I think that's at least just my thought is if it's on the front end, they definitely need to be involved. Not that they don't longer, you know, down the road, but I think for sure they almost help set the trajectory of what you are doing and are not doing. And I know that can sound controlling, but I think you guys see what I'm saying. Well, I think the truth is that our spouses, and I mentioned this, our spouses probably recognize the slippery slopes better and yes. sooner than we do. Yeah, no um, question. And to go back to my story of fantasy sports, I was not the one that put fantasy sports in my you know middle circle for guardrails. It was the first time we were talking it over as a couple, and my wife said, well, what about fantasy sports? And I'm like, what about fantasy sports? <laughs> She's like, well, don't you think that should be off the list for now? And I'm like, 
what no I was, <laughs> like i was actually super defensive I was like what's the big deal yeah. with that and she's like walked through how the last three times you've confessed to me about a relapse they all started with right. this and, the, and the, yeah and it was humbling it was like oh Oh, you're right. And and I was still, again, I don't want to glorify like my response of being all wonderful because I was, I was a little myth by it of like, I, yeah. why should I have to do that? Or I don't right. see the point or it's not connected. And it literally came to the point, my wife said something to the effect of, you can have fantasy sports or you can have me, but you can't have both. Oh. Which do you want? And I was like, okay, I think this is pretty serious. Yeah. But, but as I look wow. back, she wasn't, she wasn't attacking the fantasy sports, right? She was seeing this has been part of the pattern that really, really hurts me. Yeah. And if you're not willing to change the pattern, I feel like you're not willing to stop hurting me. And why would I want that? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's the role I think spouses have is if they, you know, and, and I would say this in a relationship where you're working on, you know, rescuing and saving the marriage. I mean, they don't have a whole lot to offer if they're, mm -hmm. if they've given up and left the home. And I mean, maybe you don't choose to value what they say then, but if, if they're trying yeah. to fight for the marriage with you and they see something and say, this is a problem, I, like I said, I didn't do great in that one, but don't argue with them. Be like, okay, I think there's something here I'm not seeing. Mm -hmm. I'm blind to it, yeah. but I trust that if you see it, and, and it, I think it's okay if you ask for clarification because maybe you're uh, afraid that they're just being punitive or uh, that they're just kind of attacking something for no reason. But I think if you'll really listen, that's not their heart. Their heart is to say, I have seen consistently this leads to this leads to this. And you're, you're willing to say, okay, let's, Let's deal with that. Let's get it off the table so yeah. that you can see my sincerity and change. Because that's going back to that conversation with my wife. Like, if you're not willing to let go of something like watching TV alone at night yeah. or fantasy sports yeah. or, you know, whatever it is, they're like, if you won't even change that and yet you're saying, I'll do anything to make this up to you, they're like, no, you won't. You're not even willing to give up some little thing that I'm saying is part of your journey. So yeah. I, I think they have a huge role to play and they may ask, for you to change some things that you don't yet see why yeah. you need to. But I would say, man, again, if they're fighting for the marriage with you, go yeah. with it. Because right. if it's going to help you restore the marriage and trust between yeah. you and your spouse, like it's worth it.